So welcome everybody to another episode of CalcCast, the podcast all about calculus, all things teaching, and a little bit of pop culture. I am Brian Passwater, your co-host, and I am sitting here with my other co-host, Tony Record. Tony, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm uh, really excited about season two. I guess this is season two because it's it's been we've been on a little hiatus, mm-hmm. ten month hiatus. I guess those first two episodes just completely wore us out. But uh, we do thank you for all of your positive uh, input. In fact, we we have a big mailbag here. Uh, I got the mailbag. I get kind of empty and show you. Um, yeah, we, we've got a couple of pieces of mail, I guess, um, from our viewers, kind of thanking us, giving us some ideas for future. Uh, uh, episodes and whatnot. But no, seriously, we do thank you for all the great feedback, uh, both via YouTube, via the Facebook group. And uh, it's something that Brian and I certainly uh, enjoy doing. We hope to bring you many, many more of these in the future. And although we've taken such a, a long hiatus, we can't, we could not have come back uh, any better than, than with our guest today. And I'm excited because he certainly is one of my favorite people, not only in the world of higher education, but in, in the AP calculus community as well. Absolutely. Yeah, like as Tony said, we are very excited to, to be back. Um, today we have with us uh, Steve Kakaska um, from Bloomsburg University, who was the former chief reader for AP Calculus. Um, and like Tony said, um, Steve has been uh, someone that has impacted um, thousands of calculus teachers and, and even more students uh, across the country. Um, and his, his footprint on calculus will be seen uh, many, many years uh, into the future. So uh, without further ado, I just want to welcome you, Stephen, to our podcast. How are you today? Thanks a million, Tony. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Nice to be talking with both of you. Thanks. Absolutely. It'll be a lot of fun. Well, we're absolutely uh, glad that you're here. Um, our season one podcast, like Tony said, have gone viral with literally hundreds of views. Um, I can't <laughs> imagine how this one's going to blow up. But um, Stephen, we'll just jump right into it. So you, sure. you were the chief reader uh, before our current chief reader of Stephen Davis. Um, yes. Can you kind of walk us through um, your involvement with the reading? So like, when did you first get involved with the calculus reading and what roles? And then how have your roles evolved over the years until it culminated in uh, your chief reader position? Sure. Well, I started teaching at Colgate University in upstate New York, and uh, one of my colleagues there was just finishing with the AP Calculus reading, Al Strand, and he suggested that I become involved, and I did. And so my first reading was in, I think it was 1986. Uh, that was the last time I think that the reading was held in New Jersey. It was at Ryder College. And uh, after that, it shifted to Clemson, and so I was a reader down there for a couple of years and then became a table leader. Uh, and then the reading shifted to Fort Collins, Colorado, quite a different venue in a beautiful place, beautiful part of the country. Uh, and there I became a question leader and worked my way up to be the alternate exam leader at that time. Uh, things were a little bit more informal, uh, but I was in charge of all the grading of the alternate exam. And uh, then when we moved from there out to Kansas City, uh, again, I was an exam leader and worked my way up to chief reader. Uh, quite, a, quite a course, quite a run. Uh, been delightful to meet so many enthusiastic, committed AP calculus teachers. Uh, it's been a blast. That's great. Can you walk us through a little bit of um, the responsibilities of how does a, a reader vary from a table leader and how does that differ from someone who becomes a question leader and an exam leader? Um, what are kind of the responsibilities that are unique to those positions? Okay, I'll do my best. Sure. A reader in general is just responsible for darn it, scoring the exam. So they would report for the seven day reading and do the eight to five, just scoring exams. So a table leader, as you know, is one of the managers in a quote unquote room. Usually there are 14 to 16 readers in a room and a table leader will work with a table leader partner. Uh, they usually report two days before the reading begins. Uh, they help setting the standard uh, for each problem by looking through uh, some exams, not scoring them, uh, but in order to see how the current standard would read, help the question leader form the standard, set the standard. 
And then during the reading, they serve as sort of the first line of not defense, that's not the right word, but if a reader has a question, they would ask their reader partner, and if they can't resolve the issue, then they would go to the table leader. And table leaders are also responsible for back reading, and that often worries a lot of readers, but it's just a part of quality control, just to make sure that everybody is scoring the problem in the exact same way. Uh, so table leaders generally back read, certainly at the very beginning uh, of scoring a problem, just to make sure that everybody is, is on the same page and reading it according to the same standard. Uh, table leaders, some table leaders participate in a question team. So there is a question leader for each of the nine free response questions. Question leader is separate from a table leader, but usually has two table leaders as question team members. Uh, they work as a group to set the standard. They are the most familiar with that particular problem. Uh, the question leader usually uh, usually reports to the reading five days ahead of everybody else, four or five days ahead of everyone else, to work on setting the standard. And the question leader is the person who would present the briefing to all of the readers, so presenting the scoring standard, presenting some examples. This is how we'll score this problem in certain situations. Uh, the question leader uh, does not, in general, score exams in any room, uh, but the question leaders usually have a room in sort of the center of the reading, as you know, in Kansas City. And they handle all questions that a reader can't answer, that a table leader can't answer. Uh, they also generally score uh, some of the odd booklets or special booklets that come in, uh, sometimes some of the late booklets. And let's see, after the question leader, above a question leader would be an exam leader. So there is an AB exam leader, a BC exam leader, and then there are other exam leaders for the other exams, for example, the alternate exam. And uh, they are ultimately in charge of, well, that exam. So as the standards are set, uh, the exam leader is in on all of those discussions, making suggestions, drawing on experience, drawing on past exams and sometimes making the final decision before it gets to the chief reader, who ultimately uh, looks at it or considers a presentation from the question leader with the exam leader in the room, and finally everyone decides on the scoring standard. So we have readers who do the bulk of the scoring, we have table leaders who back read, do a little bit about quality control, we have question leaders who present the briefing who are in charge of a particular question, pre-response question. We have exam leaders who are in charge of each exam. And then we have our chief reader. Wonderful. And of all those roles, if we took out the chief reader portion of it, what was, what was your favorite uh, position that you held outside of being the chief reader for us? Um, well, I'd have to say that table leader is probably the most enjoyable at the reading. Uh, if you are not part of the question team, it's one of the most enjoyable. You get to meet so many more people. Uh, you're in charge of our reading room. Uh, it's just very enjoyable. Uh, meeting a lot of different diverse people, uh, at least scoring probably three or four problems. Uh, I've really enjoyed that role a lot. And this is the role that you've come back to, correct? So what that is correct, is yeah. Reader role? That is you took a year off and then you're back uh, as a table leader, correct? That is correct, yeah, and I'll be back again this year as a TL, that's correct, yeah. That, that's awesome, so uh, if you're watching this and you're a reader, uh, be sure to look for Steven. Uh, Please, that would be great. He'll, he'll certainly uh, take you under his wing and maybe you'll be lucky enough to be uh, one of the 14 or 16 that's at his table this, this That'd year. That'd be great. Um, so Steven, you can, you can protect names uh, if you need to. <laughs> But you, during your time as chief reader, uh, do you yes. have any stories or just crazy things that has happened that maybe people who are just not readers or just only readers would have never have known? You know, like um, it's something that's kind of like people wouldn't have known about that you look back at it now and you're like, oh man, I can't believe that happened. 
Oh boy, crazy stories. Uh, well, I'll tell you one of the most enjoyable, enjoyable moments for me uh, was when I first became a reader. This was one of the first couple of years. Um, think about uh, for a minute, Brian, with me. Do you remember the first calculus book that you ever used as a student? Oh, yes. Do you remember? Who wrote it? Bukowski. Okay, so one of the first calculus books that I ever used was by Lewis Lightholt, if you remember him. Mm -hmm. Well, Lewis Lightholt was a reader, and I had the opportunity to, to sit down and have a meal or two with him, and we became very good friends. And I actually worked on a project with him that was math-related. It was actually a calculus and art project. And that was one of the most rewarding things for me. Um, I also had the opportunity a couple years after that to meet uh, Jamie Escalante. Mm -hmm. He was a reader, I think, for one year at least. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I remember meeting him. Uh, I, I think those are two of my most memorable moments. Oh, for sure. Absolutely, yes. Um, talk to us a little bit, because even as a reader, I'm amazed by this, but when you're <laughs> the proof reader, you're you're keeping track of so many things because we have people on different paths right so yep. some, some groups are grading certain questions other groups are grading other questions and there's a lot of math involved in, in knowing how do we make sure these groups are are finishing not just on time but at the mm -hmm. same time right so you're, you're pulling mm -hmm. some people off and moving some people around talk a little bit about that process and just the logistics in general of how do we get 400 and some thousand exams <laughs> all done on time to this location and sorted and, and moved around? Like what goes into that for someone who doesn't realize the, the enormous task that's involved? That's a great question. Uh, it's changed a little bit over the years. Uh, it's changing a little bit this year too. I shouldn't reveal that yet, but at least when I was chief reader, we have uh, what is called the flow and that's how the exams will be read. So uh, at least during my tenure, uh, we, of course, divide the readers up into A, B exams and B, C, A, B rooms and B, C rooms. And at that time, every reader had the opportunity to read four problems. Uh, at least one of them would be a, a calculator actor problem. And so uh, I used to give a lot of talks about this, Brian. You may have seen one or two of them. Tony may have seen these uh, where I talk about the flow and how everybody starts out reading one uh, common problem. And then we split into sort of a roadmap. So as one group finishes scoring a problem, they would go on to the next one and be briefed. They finish that, they go on to the next one and be briefed. And then at least when I did that, at the very end, we would bring all of these four roots back together to the one common problem and theoretically everyone would finish together. Now, the way that I did that, of course, I knew what the problems would be on the exam. And I did my very best to try to arrange them according to what I thought would be the easiest or the most difficult to score. Because you didn't want one root stuck and way behind. So how does it all get done at the reading is a really good question. Um, I think my savior was Craig Turner, you may know him. So he was a, a reader way back at Clemson and then became the chief aide. And he's probably been the chief aide now for over 30 years. And he just has this innate sense of how the reading is going and where the boxes should be. And the truth is, he does walk around and take a pretty careful count of all of the uh, folders or boxes that have been scored. And so at every break, as you know, we have a morning break and then a lunch and an afternoon break. And then, of course, the evening one, he would give the chief reader a tally and his prediction about how fast we're going and when we would finish. Now, what's interesting is that ETS would also do the same, uh, because, as you know, we now score with bubble sheets. Mm -hmm. And so ETS would take these bubble sheets and run them through their computer or scanner. And they would issue a report that said, this is when we think they'll finish. And you know what? Craig Turner would always be more accurate. <laughs> so I would rely heavily upon him. Uh, you know, he would say, look, it, it seems like this group is going to finish, you know, within the next hour. We ought to prep for this briefing. So we'd get the next QL ready. We'd get all the copies ready. And, and I'd rely very heavily on him. He does a great job at it. I believe he's coming back for one more year. Great. 
Uh, so there is a flow, mm -hmm. there is a path, there is a route that everyone follows, but we rely heavily on experience and a little bit about what ETS tells us. <laughs> and if you are a reader um, and you don't know who Craig Turner is, um, if you ever see him at the reading uh, during the grading, you're about to be released for a break or a lunch. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Good point. Sure. He's usually uh, releasing you for lunch or, or, or a break as he's probably going through and counting the, uh, like you said, the boxes and the exams. But Yeah, uh, great point. Yeah, what a great shout out for him because I've, I've heard his name uh, yeah. talked about very highly among many, many people in the reading, um, yeah. what he's contributed. So uh, it's great to hear That's that. Great so, job. Yeah, and I think Tony had a, uh, a quick question uh, sure. about logistics too about the. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, every time I go to the reading, I you know I have I have it uh, read but just the four years, but I, I'm just always amazed at the, at the at the handling of the logistics. And I, I guess there's a couple of things I want you to speak of. I, I want you to to go ahead and tell our viewers because many of them may not know exactly how many numbers of exams we're looking at because the the number is absolutely astounding every time I hear it. And then also, you know, there's so many variables and intangibles uh, that, that can harm or, 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 or better the process as it moves uh, through its beginning stages to its end stages prior to the reading, during the reading, post reading. I want you to, to just give a hypothetical scenario as to what would categorically be recognized as a chief reader's worst nightmare at the reading. Okay. So I think we're up to about 450,000 exams each year, which is just absolutely amazing. Uh, and, and it all gets done in a seven day period. Um, I think there are, are two worst nightmares. How about that, Tony? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so one of them is, of course, that the exams don't make it to the, uh, to the reading. So if there are late exams, if you're missing, you know, God forbid, of 50 or 60,000 exams, and they don't make it to Kansas City in time. There's nothing you can do, and those exams will be classified as late exams, and they'll have to be sent out to, you know, people all across the country to be graded. So I don't know if that would be my worst nightmare, but I think for ETS, it would be awful. Uh, that's just a logistic nightmare, because in general, you're not going to, you don't generally send these exams all to the same person to grade all six problems. You could but you might send the group to, you know, the QL for question one and then the QL for question two. So that would be horrible. Um, so the other, I think, nightmare really at the reading would be if all of a sudden something happens and one problem is just grading unbelievably slowly. You know, what do you do? Uh, you know, you've got a group of AB readers, let's say, and they're grading AB five. And, you know, we expected them to be done by day four, and here it is day six, and they're still slogging through it. I mean, that's just incredible, and, and uh, it would be extremely difficult to deal with. Um, ETS generally gives chief readers some leeway uh, to keep readers there a little bit later in the evening or have them come in a little bit early, but as both of you know, that's tough. I mean, if you sit there and grade or score exams, for eight hours a day, and then to be asked to come in early or to be asked to come in, or excuse me, to stay later, that's tough. So I think that would be a real nightmare. Uh, and as I'm uh, thinking out loud here, uh, how about this partial nightmares, Tony? When you get to the last day, you cannot dismiss everyone until every exam on site has been scored. So generally what happens is you reach a point where ETS will say, okay, uh, all but 100 exams, let's say 100 questions have been scored. So you can dismiss all of the readers. So what we generally do is dismiss all of the readers and the, and the table leaders remain to finish up the remaining exams. But you have to find them and sometimes they're quote unquote missing. And you get a report, the chief reader receives a report from ETS about, well, these are the folders that have not been scored. These are the boxes that you're in, that they are in. And now you've got to search the entire convention center and find them. And, and that's a real task and can take a long time. I think I recall one instance 
where a missing folder was actually taped up and put on the truck ready to ship back to Princeton. And we found it in town. So you can't dismiss everyone until all of those exams are accounted for and scored that are on site. How about that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> So, Stephen, you know, you are our, our most recent uh, former chief reader, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Thanks. And, and Michael Boardman before you, is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. And we currently have, have Stephen Davis. Um, you know, like there's this, this thing that goes on with like U.S. presidents, right? Where when, when a president <laughs> leaves the office, they kind of leave a note for the, for the current president. But there's sort of this club of, of former presidents that always kind of talk to each other because they're the only ones that really understand what, what's going on. Do you find yourself, like, do you and, and, and Mike Boardman and, and Stephen uh, Davis kind of share and swap stories, or, or does he ever ask you guys for advice or just kind of say, oh, I can't believe this happened? And um, That's a happened? great question. It's an excellent question. I think uh, during Stephen Davis's first year, we communicated an awful lot. Awful lot of little questions, awful lot of logistic questions. Uh, and then after that, I think he's done a tremendous job. Um, as it turns out, I think I've communicated more with uh, Julie Clark already, who will be our next chief reader. Uh, she was actually an enormous help to me. Uh, she was serving as an exam leader and question leader when I was chief reader. And uh, I, I hope that I'll be able to help her return the favor is the way that I would think about it. Yeah. And so, so um, I, I don't, I, I would also say, Brian, that uh, although we do, uh, we do talk to one another. I, I also think that everyone wants to, uh, I don't want to say make their own mark, but everyone has their own style and their own way of addressing issues. Uh, so I, I think I asked Michael uh, for lots of advice during my first year or first half year, and then you sort of make your own way and, sure. uh, and solve your own problems. So yeah, that's a good question. And, and you mentioned uh, Julie Clark, and so that's kind of a good segue. So uh, Stephen Davis will be encountering his, his last year this coming correct. summer. Correct. So the chief reader, is it a, uh, a three-year um, term? Is that what it is? It's a four-year appointment. Okay. Yep. So uh, Julie, Julie's been serving as the chief reader designate this year. Sure. So she's been attending all of the development committee meetings, and I, I believe she also went to the chief reader meeting. So she's been involved probably in – in uh, all of the communications that Stephen Davis has been sending and receiving. And she'll take over as of the end of the reading this summer. So this right. is not really particular for Julie, but just for any future chief reader, right? Um, and she just happens to be the next one, but what would be sort of like your, from experience, kind of like your, your big pieces of advice for a new chief reader, right? So, you know, just, the things that you've gathered that maybe you didn't automatically know intuitively before you came in, um, what do you wish every future chief reader would know so that way they could make their own mark like you mentioned? Well, I would suggest that Julie, and we've already talked about this, that you concentrate on the mathematics. Yeah. Uh, there are so many other decisions that a chief reader has to make. For example, do we need cookies or brownies at this reception? All right, the chief reader has to sign off on that. You know, don't worry about the little stuff like that. Uh, and I, I think, uh, I probably shouldn't put this on a podcast, but I think I used to ask for forgiveness rather than ask for permission. So I, I tried to do what was right and fair, Brian, and, and that's the advice that I would give Julie, and I think I have already. That's, that, that's great. So are you saying that um, officially you can say right now whether we're going to have brownies or cookies? <laughs> You I don't know if Julie made travel. that decision. <laughs> I, I would, I would no. like to know before, uh, before June, if possible. You know what? I, you just reminded me, too, though, Brian. You know what else was a lot of fun as chief reader was uh, the chief reader has the opportunity to invite the, uh, uh, one of the speakers for professional night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that. I asked for uh, a lot of advice from people, and I got some great suggestions. Uh, and I met some really nice people. Uh, I think one of the most enjoyable uh, times I had was when, maybe you may uh, remember this, we had Calculus the Musical there. A lot of fun. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. was a, that was a great time. Uh, yeah, yeah, they did a great job. I wish we had a bigger place for them to have done their uh, performance. Yeah. They did a great job when they were there. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It, great it was job. awesome. 
So yeah. we're going to take um, a quick, uh, not a break, but a, a little bit of a, a divergence. Uh, okay. Quick game with you, and then we'll kind of come okay. back and we'll talk this question. So um, as wait a as, minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is there a prize here? Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. You, you're either going to get a brownie or a cookie oh, at, at the reading. <laughs> yeah. I don't know which one yet, but you're going to get one of those too. Um, all right. Shoot. Go ahead. So, so this is a game that all of our avid followers know that we play. Um, every time that we have a podcast, we, we I call it this fast five. Um, okay. Ask you five uh, seemingly random questions about you. Uh, and okay. you just give us whatever comes off the top of your mind. Um, and, and okay. Not a quiz, just about, this is all about Steve Kokoska. So, um, okay, shoot. number one, what's one hobby that you do outside of uh, teaching mathematics? Ooh, that's a great question. I have just taken up pickleball, one yes. of the fastest growing sports in America. Absolute blast. Uh, where I am now, uh, it is, there's a ton of people who play here. Uh, in fact, I played this morning. Great that's time. Awesome. That yep. brought me back to eighth grade gym class. Um, <laughs> You know, we have at least one more year in Kansas City. We thought we were yes. done, but we, we got pulled back in. What's yes. your favorite place to eat, or what do you look forward to eating, either a, a restaurant or just one of the meals they serve at the reading that you really look forward to each summer? Hey, you know what? I really enjoy Gates Barbecue. They've got a if lot you know of what that is. there. That's, that's one of the best. Yeah, I enjoy it. Um, of all the places that you visited, number three, uh, you've done a lot of traveling, I'm sure, personally, but also for conferences and workshops. Uh, what's been your favorite place that you've traveled to, either for work or just for enjoyment? Good question. Um, I would have to say that uh, my favorite places are any of the workshops that I've done in China. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is because they're so interested right now in the AP program, which is growing over there. And okay, kind of egotistically, but they really treat uh, professors, teachers differently over there with much more respect than they do in this country. Yeah. And that, that's just an absolute blast. I've enjoyed my trips to China. It's a long trip. It's a long flight. Uh, but that's been a blast for me, Brian. That's awesome. Number four, uh, we know that you are on sabbatical, but you're a professor at Bloomsburg. What is yes. your um, favorite course to teach when you are teaching there? Well, I certainly enjoy calculus, uh, but I also enjoy teaching intro stats. And uh, one of the reasons is uh, because I've taken on using R in class, which I think is very valuable for students. And I am continuously amazed at people who develop this stuff for nothing. And it's absolutely free, uh, used by businesses, governments, all kinds of companies. I think that is a terrific tool for students uh, and I use a lot of technology in class, a lot of technology to uh, present uh, lectures, try to communicate more with my students there. I really enjoy that class. Awesome. And question number five, uh, you win millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, yeah. What is Steve Kokoska's dream car purchase that he has with no budget? Oh, uh, no question. Uh, BMW 750. I've got a picture of it over here. <laughs> Is, it, you know, is there a color that you have to choose with it? Oh, it's got to be white. White. Hard top, convertible, what is it? Oh, definitely hard top, four door. Okay. So if somebody's <laughs> looking for a little uh, gift for, for Stephen, I think we figured out. Uh, that's, that's the one. Figure out what it is. And then uh, we have one bonus question. This is, this okay. is, Shoot. This is a bonus question. Um, one of the papers that you have written a while back is called 50 Famous Curves. Uh, yes. Yeah kind of discuss 50 famous curves in mathematics and some kind of some unique properties and some things that you can do with them mathematically in your math courses. Yeah. Is there a favorite curve or equation of yours? I know this is getting pretty nerdy, but I'm, I'm a nerdy guy and I have my own favorite functions or favorite curves. Do you have a favorite curve uh, that just fascinates you? Uh, boy, there are two that I'm thinking of right now. One of them is, uh, it kind of looks like the normal curve. I think it's the Witch of Agnesi, if that's the right way to say it. Yep. I like that one. I've done a lot of examples with that one. And then there's another one, oh, and I've forgotten the name now, but it's defined parametrically. It kind of looks like a slanted loop. Mm -hmm. That's a great curve because there's lots of cool calculus problems in there with limits and how to sketch that what the values of t have to be to vary to, to get that on your calculator. That's a great one too. Now, is that one in your paper as well? 
It is indeed. So if, if for listeners, if you Google right now, uh, 50 Famous Curves by Stephen Kokoska, you can see it. And he has not just the curves and some of their properties, but for, yeah. for many of them, some mathematical questions that you can put uh, into using your classroom. I know that I've used it, um, not the whole paper, but I've used certain curves and certain questions um, in some of my courses. Um, and and it's, been, it's been interesting. It's fun to show students um, some of these interesting curves and, and some of the byproducts and things that yep. come out of them. So, so thank cool. you for, for writing that and thank you for playing uh, fast. Sure. <laughs> one, plus one bonus question. So, oh, good. Um, good. so, so back to our, our conversation. So um, Stephen, like we mentioned, you, you do teach at, at Bloomsburg, but you've been on a sabbatical um, yes. and, and it's one long sabbatical, but it was two uh, large projects um, that you've been working on. Um, we know that you've completed uh, recently, um, a year ago or so, the, the calculus textbook, um, mm -hmm. and, and that was co-authored with uh, Stewart, is that correct? Yes, the late James Stewart, that's correct. And yep. what is that, uh, the title of that book called? Uh, it's AP Calculus, A Complete Course. Uh, the, the editor, uh, Gary Whalen at the time, uh, knew that I was a, a chief reader and said, look, here's, uh, here's all of the material. Here's Stewart's calculus book. Uh, write it in uh, an AP calculus lingo. He gave me a lot of leeway, a lot of flexibility. And uh, I'd like to think that that's the first AP calculus book that is written like that, not just a calc book uh, where they add AP calculus questions in the exercises, but rather written completely throughout Mm -hmm. in AP calculus terminology and lingo and style. Yeah. Uh, so that was out in January uh, of, this, of last year. Um, and that, and that um, book may or may not look like this. <laughs> there you go. Thank That's you, Tony. Clear. <laughs> so I know you're going to ask this, Tony, so I'm going to tell you anyway, uh, why is there a piano on the cover? <laughs> yes. So that's because I play the piano? And I asked them if they could somehow combine that with Stewart's famous cover with the uh, with this sort of integral sign on the violin or the viola, which was kind of cool, I thought. So. And, and the uh, other project, the other project, Ryan, this semester, I'm uh, working on the third edition of my intro stats book, which is a non-calculus based college level introductory stats book. Uh, it's non-calculus based, but it's written from a mathematical perspective. Uh, for those people who teach intro stats, it's different uh, from sort of the Moore and McCabe approach, where it is a little bit more mathematical, not more difficult, but more mathematical, where we emphasize a little bit more about probability. And the emphasis there is on uh, statistical inference. So I'm working on that now. I'm uh, actually looking at copy edited pages these days, and uh, that should be out by the end of the calendar year. It's been a lot of fun. That's fantastic. And, and I know, Stephen, that um, you're very proud of, of both of, the, of those projects, um, but you're also very humble. And so um, as Tony kind of mentioned, and, and Tony and I have talked about this, um, we can definitely, as a calculus teacher, um, confirm that this is uh, the calculus book is certainly a book that's written from beginning to end with the AP calculus teacher and student in mind. And so um, I, I think I talked to you uh, either a couple of weekends ago when we were in Dallas and, and I told you, I think that you're going to force a lot of other books to change some of the things they've done with, with what you've done. Um, I have had uh, the privilege of, of editing or not editing, but reviewing one of those chapters when you were writing it and I remember when I was reading it thinking, oh my gosh, like this is the book that I wish I would have had when I was a first year calculus teacher, um, teaching out of the, a book that was a great calculus book, but not an AP calculus book. Mm -hmm. As an AP teacher or a first year AP teacher, uh, there were so many things that I didn't know about the AP exam or how to prepare kids for the AP expectations uh, that weren't embedded already in the traditional college textbook. And so uh, thank you for putting that into a book uh, to help that learning curve for so many teachers, whether they're uh, coming into calculus for the first time or whether they've been teaching it for 10, 15, or, or 20 years. So um, I think that work is going to, like we said earlier, make a, a very lasting imprint uh, on different calculus teachers and students all across the country for, for many, many years. So thanks, Brian. Thank you. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but we're already thinking about two weeks. 
<laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So if you if you are looking at textbook adoption or you're a new calculus teacher looking at textbooks, um, I know there's a lot of great resources out there, but I, I would say um, from a first person uh, point of view, um, look into into Steve's book at least um, as one of your your short lists. Um, and then make the decision that's best for you and your kids from there. So, uh, so thank yeah. you for your for your work on that, Steve. Thanks, Brian. And, and if I may, you know, I, as you know, uh, I'm always willing to uh, talk to a group of students, talk to a group of teachers, uh, even do a little bit of traveling. Uh, I have in the past done uh, Zoom conferences like this with student groups, with teacher groups. Mm -hmm. So I would be delighted to do that. And, and that's I think that's one of the things that's really marked um, your time as chief reader. Um, and, and even since then, is that um, you were my first chief reader. So I think I came on, <laughs> you came on board. I think we came on together, but you had been there uh -huh. in 86, and I was just coming for the first time. But I remember remarking uh, at my first reading how accessible and, and um, collegial you were with everybody at the reading, you know, that, that you didn't take it as here's the college professors and then here's the high school teachers. It was a we're all in this together. We're yep. all we're all colleagues we're all teaching the same course for the same purposes just in different situations and different places and so um i've always been impressed with with your ability to to fit in with whatever group that you're in and make everyone feel welcome make everyone feel uh that they're important uh as they are um and that everyone has the right to ask questions and and, and enjoy the time right. thank you brian thank you very much yeah it is a wonderful community and it should be just that it should be a community and I tried very hard to, to promote that. Thank you. And Stephen Davis has done a great job of continuing that. And Indeed. I'm sure Julie will uh, pick up the torch in, in 2020 and, and continue that as well. So, um, so Stephen, here's a, uh, a put you on the spot question. Okay, uh, shoot. So you've seen many, many, many FRQs, free response questions over the years. And, and you've had to, you know, look at the scoring guidelines and all these things. You've seen the development of many, many questions. Is there a question or a couple questions that stand out to you that you've seen them and you just thought, what a great question. You know, where you, <laughs> where you want to almost go find out who wrote the question. Maybe you might have known who wrote it and just thought, what a great question this is. Either it's just poetic or just beautiful in, in the way that it's solved. Um, which ones have stood out to you as just been um, unique or just interesting okay. for a variety of reasons? Okay, I got one for you, okay? So personal bias, uh, I don't know if you'll remember this one. Uh, this was probably about, oh, seven or eight years ago. It was a BC question and it involved a diver mm -hmm. and parametric curves. Yep. So I have to tell you that that's my favorite question. And the reason is because darn it, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and because I wrote it because my daughter was a diver at the time. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of calculus in here. And so I sat down and thought a little bit about it and did a little bit of research about how high they dive and so forth and described their arc or, or curve as they went into the water. No question, that was one of my favorites. And as I, I think back, thinking out loud again, there was one a few years ago, um, I believe this was while I was chief reader. Do you remember the, no, maybe not. Do you remember the one about the snowfall on the driveway? Yeah, the peace yeah, life functions. Yeah, that was... Uh, that was a great question because, in my mind, that was one of the first questions where students had to work with a piecewise defined function in a long time. And uh, I don't, if I, if I remember correctly, I don't think students did that well on that problem. But I thought that was a great question, a really good problem, and it set the stage for more questions that involve piecewise defined functions. Yeah, like we saw this year with the escalator question, right? Or that last yeah. piecewise, piecewise problem. You mentioned yes. that the snowfall problem, you know, students didn't do too well on it. Um, no. So when you're, when, when, when we're writing questions, when the development team is writing questions, yes. what do they want? Tell us about what's a perfect score for the ETS, you know, um, for average scores. Um, that, that gives us the best um, information about a student. So what would they hope the mean would be um, for a typical FRQ question out of nine points? Yeah, that's a good question. ETS in general would like to have a mean of exactly five, uh, and they'd like to have a reasonable standard deviation. And the reason is, of course, that they have a nice spread. It's easy to distinguish between the really good students and the not so good students. 
So if you have a, a have a question where everyone gets a two or a one, you know, uh, the average or pardon me, the mean is 1.5, that doesn't help you distinguish at all. If you have a two a question that's too easy, and everyone gets you know eight points, well, that doesn't help either. Mm -hmm. So the development committee thinks a lot about that. Um, as you know, when they develop a question, when they start to write a question, it starts out with many parts, you know, maybe 20 points. And so we, we look to cut out certain parts and we modify certain parts so that we get exactly nine points. And we think very carefully about, well, which parts will students get? The chief reader, of course, is involved in all of those discussions. And, and we try very hard uh, so that to, to get students a mean of around five. Um, as you know, that, that doesn't happen too often, but we try very hard for that. That's great. Um, so we kind of piggybacking on this idea of student performance. We yes. definitely see more of those under three averages than we do the over five averages. Yeah. Right? We see more yeah. Of those questions. You know, as someone who's been a chief reader and you've been very involved, obviously teaching calculus at Bloomsburg and, and doing conferences, what do you think is one or two, what are one or two topics in the curriculum that you have noticed that students struggle on significantly um, that we need to help teachers with resources, support, um, or just something to help these topics become more understandable, relatable, uh, for student success. So what are those couple areas that you feel like have always been a struggle across the board for majority of students? Well, I don't know if I can give you one specific topic, Brian. I, I don't want to uh, feel like I'm dodging the question. Uh, you know, with the curriculum framework, uh, the development committee and ETS are charged with making sure that they hit all of the topics, all of the EKs and LOs in the curriculum framework. So the truth is, there is no one particular topic that they target. Uh, what I see in general is that students, let me back up just a little bit. What I see in general is that there are many more problems now with a lot of writing. So I don't like using the word, but I think there are a lot more problems that are contextual. There's a lot of writing, which makes it difficult for some of our students where English is the second language. And I get that, and I'm sensitive to that. But many of these problems have a lot more writing. Many of these problems involve, uh, not circumstances, but they involve uh, applications which students might not be familiar with, but they still have to apply the correct mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now that said, I think one of the biggest changes that I've seen over the years is that students have to write more. It's not just solve this problem or solve this equation. They need to write more, they need to communicate more, and they need to communicate better. And so my best piece of advice would be to tell students to communicate succinctly. Write as little as possible. Uh, I'm amazed uh, that you can score points for writing so little these days. For example, think about a calculator active question where generally one of the problems involves, let's say, accumulation, where we're given a, a, you know, a rate, and we have to find a definite integral from zero to 30 of this rate function. Generally, something like that is a two-point question. And what does a student have to write for that? Just the definite integral mm -hmm. and just the answer. Um, that's a, and to me, that's a real big change from many years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that, you know, students have to communicate a lot and I would suggest don't write too much. You know, we have that phrase, we have lingo at the reading, don't say too much. Because sometimes if you go on and you say too much, you may lose credit. So you want to answer the question, justify your answers by using the information that's given in the question, and don't write too much. Okay? Great advice. So if we have teachers that are watching today and they want to come see you either doing a, a presentation or a conference somewhere that's open to the public, um, what's coming up on your radar, either a talk or a conference or a presentation or a, a consulting you know, type thing that's coming up? Um, what's coming up on your radar where people might find you out and about? Great question. Uh, next week is NCTM. I assume you and Tony, one of you going to be there, both of you? I wish I would, but I, I can't. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll be at NCTM. 
Uh, I'm going to do a presentation with Tom Dick out there. We're going to talk about our TI in focus materials for uh, Texas Instruments, uh, where we developed a series of five videos focused on each of the three response questions from 2018 and 2019. So we do a video on scoring standard. I do that video. We do a video on technology solutions associated with each free response question. We also, or I also add uh, some extra AP calculus type questions to help prepare your students for the exam. And then I also, also do a content lecture. Uh, so what I've done is I've looked at each free response question and pulled out a, a specific topic. For example, uh, L'Hopital's rule or improper integrals. And I present a 10 to 15 minute uh, presentation on that topic, which a teacher could use uh, just to help refresh them themselves or even in class. And then Tom has done two TI uh, calculator videos, one on the 84 and one using the TI Inspire, specifically showing uh, people how to use basic keystrokes to solve some of the problems that I talk about in my technology solutions. So Tom and I are going to be talking about that at NCTM, and I'll also be at the uh, Cengage booth uh, talking a little bit about my calculus book. That's great. And then you have the, the reading this summer. Uh, Correct. Yep. Will you be doing any uh, college board workshops this summer or coming up in the fall? I'm not doing any APSIs this summer. Uh, I do enjoy those, but I tend to leave uh, those for uh, high school AP calculus consultants. Uh, I, think, uh, I think they do a very good job at that, and I, I think they're more suited for that. In the fall, uh, I'll probably get a, a college board workshop or two, and I hope to go back to China. Um, I also uh, did an AP workshop a couple of years ago in Singapore. Uh, would enjoy going back there too, but I'm hoping to go back to China again. That'd be fun. Well, if you need an assistant for your China, <laughs> uh, somebody okay. to just take your notes for you, you know, things like that, pay for your time uh, or something. I'll, I'll let them know. <laughs> we would certainly uh, welcome that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll be well, happy to be the former chief reader assistant. Yeah. Okay. Hey, for well, those of you who aren't able to go to NCTM, um, I, I can't speak enough about the TI in Focus. And, and if it's something that you want to check out, you can check it out from the comforts of your home by just going to education.ti.com and just checking the resources tab. And it's just some amazing, amazing work. It's one of my favorite things, uh, favorite resources that, that's not only offered in part with Texas Instruments, but, but Stephen and, and, and Tom Dick from Oregon State do just a great job with it. And if you really want to become very intimately acquainted with any of the last uh, free response questions on the last two operational exams. It's a great way to do it, both via a technological lens, but also just a great pedagogical lens as well. And Stephen, you're a humble person. And um, I know that this might be a difficult question for you to answer, but what are you, what are you most proud of in terms of what you've been able to create or present so that teachers like Brian and myself, and even, even some inexperienced teachers of advanced placement calculus, can use? Uh, how about if I answer that in two ways, uh, Tony? I think uh, without question, this AP calculus book has just been uh, a blast to write. And I feel in some, some way that's uh, been my way of giving back to the AP calculus community because I think I have learned so much, uh, grown so much with that community. Uh, that's been a great way for me to give back. Uh, and the other thing, as the three of us know from teaching, um, I've always felt that, you know, along the way, if you can affect one student in a positive way, you've done a really good thing. And uh, I think there are a couple of students of mine who are out there teaching right now. And I feel really good about that. That's been a, a great joy for me. Thanks for asking. That's, that's great. So, Steve, um, we want to thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. I'm here and um, we'll, we'll wrap it up here with, with maybe one or two more questions, but I um, sure. want to be uh, considerate of your time and we appreciate you taking time out of your busy uh, Florida schedule <laughs> and football tournaments to, uh, to come talk with us. So um, if you're watching this and, and you're at the reading um, and, and maybe you're a new reader and maybe you came on when Stephen Davis uh, was already chief reader and maybe you didn't realize Steve Picasso was our, our most recent chief reader. Um, 
if you see him this summer at the reading, be sure to stop by and just tell him thank Please. you for his time. Um, I can't even imagine uh, how much uh, stress and, and pressure there is leading up to the reading, like you said. <laughs> Yeah. So all those um, nightmare scenarios don't occur, right? Um, right. You know, no one's happy uh, when they have to get up a half an hour early or stay or half an hour late because one of the questions ended up being just a tough question to read, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. and when you're when you're complaining about that, uh, if you are complaining about that during the reading, um, you're thinking, ah, Stephen Davis did this, you know, trust me, I'm sure that he is more mortified and, and upset about that than any of us could possibly be because that's the last thing that you guys want like you mentioned so um so you're you're coming back to bloomsburg um right mm -hmm. and, yes and and you, you said you've, you've taught or you have taught you know some of the calculus courses there yes talk about as we kind of wrap this up tell us about can you notice in your classes um students that have had ap versus students that have not had ap and what do you notice as the differences between those skills uh, from the mindset of what's the benefit of AP? So certainly the benefit of AP, I think, Brian, is that students who go through that course uh, tend to think more conceptually. Um, I think it is true, although probably uh, anecdotally, that some of those students aren't as good at the mechanics as some of the college students. Uh, you know, the college community has not uh, been quick to embrace uh, calculus reform. Uh, we, we don't use technology enough. There's no question about that. Uh, we still stress the mechanics. We, we still teach chapter seven techniques of integration. Uh, so I would say that I would always take any AP student in my class, any AP calculus student in my class, even if they did not pass the exam. Uh, I think they tend to be very well trained to think conceptually. Uh, they know how to use technology exceptionally well, and, and they can pick up the mechanics. So there's, a, I think, a very marked difference still between an AP calculus course in high school and a college calculus course, but generally AP calculus students can succeed easily in a calc course in college. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite quotes. You know, in the six or seven years that I've known you, I've heard you say that many times, that a that a student who, who goes through our AP calculus course, and let's say they even earn a one on their AP exam, they're always welcome in your calculus class. Yeah. And I find myself reiterating that to my students and, and to the, the students that I work with around the country through the National Math and Science Initiative and, and the teachers that I work with through the college board to say that, uh, that we, we are serving a, a very you know, useful purpose in teaching the students this type of calculus. And, it's, it's not always about the scores. Of course, we want qualifying scores. Of course, we want our students to have these wonderful numbers. But I think most importantly, we want our students to have these wonderful experiences so that they can parlay those experiences at the, at the next level. Agreed. Absolutely. I've got a question about uh, Bloomsburg University. If we're okay, on. shoot, John. That's all right. Go ahead. Uh, I think a lot of people may not be real familiar with it. It's a, it's a university, I think, in East Central Pennsylvania, I, I believe. Enrollment Very good. is yeah. what's the enrollment of Bloomsburg? What's that? What is the enrollment of Bloomsburg? Oh, uh, we're just under ten thousand. Okay, ten thousand. So, so a fairly small mm -hmm. to, mid, to mid sized university, but it mm -hmm. does have a few notable alumni. And I was going to put uh, Stephen on the hot seat here a little bit. All right, see. shoot, go ahead. He, if you can identify some of these, there's there's five notable alumnus now i'm uh -oh. going to go ahead and throw one out right okay. now so i ahead. don't know it's it's he's a professional mma fighter dennis bermudez i don't know if that's somebody that you may have had in class Ooh, doesn't ring a bell wait a minute wait a minute where, where is he uh where is he located well i you know i don't know i haven't done my research on on that one particularly all right i don't have right. we have an alumni we have an alumni who's down in florida here in the tampa area who is a uh who is a wrestler Oh, third time. I wonder, it could be Look, one of the same. That one up. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right go ahead. Four others. Uh, one of them okay. is a famous NBA coach. Uh, another one is a, 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 a just recently retired NFL offensive lineman. Okay. We've got a former governor of Pennsylvania 
and um, a quite active actor on both the screen and film fronts. So Ooh. how many of those can you name, Steve? All right. I know one of them, at least. I know Jari Evans, who played for New Orleans for a while. Mm -hmm. I actually had Jari in class, in my intro stats class. Ah. And we won't talk about grades or anything. <laughs> uh, uh, well, Jerry Evans, the only thing about Jerry Evans that he, he's sort of on my dark list because he was an offensive lineman for the New Orleans Saints during Super Bowl 44 when they defeated the Indianapolis Colts. <laughs> in that regard, I'm, I'm discounting Jerry Evans, but go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, he's been actually a great benefactor to Bloomsburg University. He's uh, given out his time and resources. In fact, just donated a, a beautiful new uh, scoreboard for the football stadium. So he's been great, uh, great for the university. Uh, basketball coach, I know this one. I know this one. Uh, I, uh, I do some work for the uh, women's basketball team. So I know this one. That's Chuck Daly. I know that one. Um, governor, former governor. I know this one because we have a room in our library named after him. So that's Mark Schweiker. Yes, right. yes. In fact, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, he was involved in that uh, mining rescue many years ago in uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Remember that? I nine believe. for nine, I think, was yes. what Yes. And let's see, actor. Nope, got me on that. Who's that? This is a tough one. Uh, he's, he's, he's performed in a, a lot of uh, television roles, and, and it's always sunny in Philadelphia, Westworld, House of Cards. Oh. And the famous film, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, which is all oh, shoot. But it <laughs> graduated, I think, in the late 90s. His name is Jimmy Simpson. Jimmy nope. Simpson. No, no. How about that? Okay. Very cool. There you go. You, you did quite well. You did <laughs> much better than I would have done. I don't know. Right, what you? Yeah, three for four. Um, Steve, that, that's a five on the AP exam. Seven, <laughs> is, is, that is a qualifying score. So we're, we're good to know that this will, this will transfer anywhere you go. So, oh, good. Good. Thank this you. This is great. So, um, Steve, I, I, thank you again for, for making time yeah. for us. I, I know that you're in the, like you said, in the copy editing stages of, of your new project. Um, Thank you for all your contributions to the calculus world through your, through your teaching, through your workshops, through your time at the reading and your different positions, and now uh, as well as, as your textbook. So um, thank you for all those things. I'm excited to see you in June. Uh, you. Everyone watching this, hopefully we'll, we'll get a chance to run into uh, and, and talk with Steve Kokoska because uh, you are always approachable, always uh, welcoming, and always have such great um, wisdom to share about teaching and, and, and the world of calculus. So thank you for joining us today and thank you for, um, for just having a great time with us. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Tony. Great job. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If you are watching this, uh, thank you again for, for joining in for season two. The, 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 this is the, the premiere episode of season two. Um, and hopefully we'll have uh, another episode coming up here uh, in not too long. So so keep your eyes and your ears uh, um, open for, for an announcement for, for the next one coming up. So uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Tony, I'll talk to you soon. And uh, thank everybody for watching. Thanks for watching, everybody.